A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. In making cloth, she showed so great a bent she bettered those of Ypres and of Ghent. In all the parish, not a dame dare stirred toward the altar steps in front of her. And if indeed they did, so wroth was she as to be quite put out of charity. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground. I dared have sworn they weighed a good ten pound, the ones she wore on Sunday, on her head. Her hose were of the finest scarlet red, and gartered tight. Her shoes were soft and new. Bold was her face, handsome and red in hue. A worthy woman all her life, what's more, she'd had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company in youth. No need just now to speak of that, forsooth. And she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. She'd been to Rome and also to Boulogne, St. James of Compostella and Cologne, and she was skilled in wandering by the way. She had gap teeth set widely, truth to say. Easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up, and on her head a hat as broad as is a buckler or a shield. She had a flowing mantle that concealed large hips, her heels spurred sharply under that. In company she liked to laugh and chat, and knew the remedies for love's mischances, an art in which she knew the oldest dances. A holy-minded man of good renown there was, and poor, the parson to a town. Yet he was rich in holy thought and work. He also was a learned man, a clerk, who truly knew Christ's gospel and would preach it devoutly to parishioners, and teach it. Benign and wonderfully diligent, and patient when adversity was sent, for so he proved in great adversity, he much disliked extorting tithe or fee, nay, rather he preferred beyond a doubt giving to poor parishioners round about from his own goods and Easter offerings. He found sufficiency in little things. Wide was his parish, with houses far asunder, yet he neglected not, in rain or thunder, in sickness or in grief, to pay a call on the remotest, whether great or small, upon his feet, and in his hand a stave. This noble example to his sheep he gave, first following the word before he taught it, and it was from the gospel he had caught it. This little proverb he would add thereto, that if gold rust, what then will iron do? For if a priest be foul in whom we trust, no wonder that a common man should rust. And shame it is to see, let priests take stock, a soiled shepherd and a snowy flock. The true example that a priest should give is one of cleanliness, how the sheep should live. He did not set his benefice to hire and leave his sheep encumbered in the mire, or run to London to earn easy bread by singing masses for the wealthy dead, or find some brotherhood and get enrolled. He stayed at home and watched over his fold, so that no wolf should make the sheep miscarry. He was a shepherd and no mercenary. Holy and virtuous he was, but then never contemptuous of sinful men, never disdainful, never too proud or fine, but was discreet in teaching and benign. His business was to show a fair behaviour and draw men thus to heaven and their saviour, unless, indeed, a man were obstinate. And such, whether of high or low estate, he put to sharp rebuke, to say the least. I think there never was a better priest. He sought no pomp or glory in his dealings. No scrupulosity had spiced his feelings. Christ and his twelve apostles and their lore he taught, but followed it himself before. There was a ploughman with him there, his brother. Many a load of dung one time or other he must have carted through the morning dew. He was an honest worker, good and true, living in peace and perfect charity, and, as the gospel bade him, so did he, loving God best with all his heart and mind, and then his neighbour as himself, repined at no misfortune, slacked for no content, for steadily about his work he went to thrash his corn, to dig or to manure or make a ditch, and he would help the poor for love of Christ and never take a penny if he could help it. And, as prompt as any, he paid his tithes in full when they were due on what he owed, and on his earnings, too.
he wore a tabard smock and rode a mare. There was a reeve, also a miller there, a college mansipal from the inns of court, a papal pardoner, and, in close consort, a church court summoner riding at a trot, and, finally, myself. That was the lot. The miller was a chap of sixteen stone, a great stout fellow, big in brawn and bone. He did well out of them, for he could go and win the ram at any wrestling show. Broad, knotty, and short-shouldered, he would boast he could heave any door off hinge and post, or take a run and break it with his head. His beard, like any sow or fox, was red, and broad as well, as though it were a spade, and at its very tip his nose displayed a wart on which there stood a tuft of hair red as the bristles in an old sow's ear. His nostrils were as black as they were wide. He had a sword and buckler at his side. His mighty mouth was like a furnace door. A wrangler and buffoon, he had a store of tavern stories, filthy in the main. His was a master hand at stealing grain. He felt it with his thumb, and thus he knew its quality, and took three times his due. A thumb of gold, by God, to gauge an oat. He wore a hood of blue and a white coat. He liked to play his bagpipes up and down, and that was how he brought us out of town. The mansiple came from the inner temple. All caterers might follow his example in buying victuals. He was never rash, whether he bought on credit or paid cash. He used to watch the market most precisely and go in first, and so he did quite nicely. Now, isn't it a marvel of God's grace that an illiterate fellow can outpace the wisdom of a heap of learned men? His masters, he had more than thirty then, all versed in the abstrusest legal knowledge, could have produced a dozen from their college, fit to be stewards in land and rents and game to any peer in England you could name, and show him how to live on what he had debt-free, unless, of course, the peer were mad, or be as frugal as he might desire and they were fit to help about the shire in any legal case there was to try. And yet this mansiple could wipe their eye. The reeve was old and choleric and thin. His beard was shaven closely to the skin. His shorn hair came abruptly to a stop above his ears, and he was docked on top just like a priest in front. His legs were lean, like sticks they were. No calf was to be seen. He kept his bins and garners very trim. No auditor could gain a point on him. And he could judge, by watching drought and rain, the yield he might expect from seed and grain. His master's sheep, his animals and hens, pigs, horses, dairies, stores and cattle pens, were wholly trusted to his government. And he was under contract to present the accounts right from his master's earliest years. No one had ever caught him in arrears. No bailiff, serf, or herdsman dared to kick. He knew their dodges, knew their every trick. Feared like the plague he was by those beneath. He had a lovely dwelling on a heath, shadowed in green by trees above the sward. A better hand at bargains than his lord, he had grown rich, and had a store of treasure well tucked away, Yet out it came to pleasure his lord with subtle loans or gifts of goods, to earn his thanks and even coats and hoods. When young, he'd learnt a useful trade, and still he was a carpenter of first-rate skill. The stallion cob he rode at a slow trot was dapple grey and bore the name of Scott. He wore an overcoat of bluish shade and rather long. He had a rusty blade slung at his side. He came, as I heard tell, from Norfolk near a place called Balderswell. His coat was tucked under his belt and splayed. He rode the hindmost of our cavalcade. <laughs>